Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. Great that you can be a part of our, of our, mess, of our church service today. Uh, last week we spoke on David and Goliath and we've been talking about different heroes of the Bible and how uh, they overcame great obstacles. And today we're going to be looking at Joshua and specifically uh, Joshua in the book of Joshua chapter 1. But before we do that, I'm going to pray. Father, we want to thank you for being with us today. We want to thank you for your guidance and your direction. We thank you, Lord, for the examples in your word of these men and women, Lord, who followed you and who were obedient to you. And, Lord, who were ultimately victorious because they focused on you. And so, Lord, we want to pray that as we look at your word today, that you would inspire us, that you would challenge us. Lord, that you would affirm us and just encourage us, Lord, in the areas where we're going well. And so, God, we, uh, we thank you for today and we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to, Joshua chapter 1 is not that long, so I'm actually going to read it for us today. It says this, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to my ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for for your own. But the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh Joshua said, remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave after he said, the Lord your God will give you, the re- give you rest by giving you this land. Your wives and children and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men ready for battle must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest as he has done for you and until they too have taken possession of the land the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan towards the sunrise. Then they answered Joshua, Whatever you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. It's an interesting story. We understand that the Israelites had come out of um, Egypt some 40 plus years before and were supposed to go into this promised land. And if you read the story in Exodus you know that there were 12 spies sent into the land some 40 years previous to this event and who were asked to go and spy the land out and to bring back a report. You see, but they misunderstood the instruction. They thought that they were going to go in, check out whether it was doable and come back and vote on whether or not they should go into the land. But that wasn't the instruction. The instruction was, go in, 
do some recon, get us some intel, some information, come back, and then we can plan for how we move in under the authority and the power and the protection of God. But they got afraid back then, some 40 years before, and 10 of the 12 said, we can't do it. The, the people there are huge, um, they're well embedded. Um, yes, it's flowing with milk and honey, and yes, there's great crops, but there's no way we can take it. But there were two guys who said we could do it. That was Joshua and that was Caleb. And those two guys said, yeah, it's going to be difficult. Yeah, it's going to be hard. But with God, we can do it. And so God was, he was annoyed. I mean, don't, don't ever, we, we read the scriptures and, and, and God is like, everything God does is from love. Everything God does is because he loves you and me. But he, like you and me, when we find something that, when, when there are issues where out of our love we get annoyed. We get, we can sometimes become angry because of a failure to see or to obey instruction. And so God was pretty annoyed. And we know he was pretty annoyed because he said to them, you're going to wander in the desert for 40 years before you have a second crack at going into the land. And in that 40 years, all of that generation, that unbelieving generation, died out. And the 10 spies who said, we can't go in, they died out, but Joshua and Caleb survived. Now, Moses should have gone into the promised land, and there's a story of him um, uh, not following God's instructions and beating a rock rather than speaking to a rock. He allowed his frustrations to control him, and God said to him, you're not going to enter in, and he died just shy of going into the promised land. And so then Joshua... The authority was passed down to him. Joshua was Moses' aid. And all of this responsibility, we're talking, you know, you go back to the, the Passover in Egypt and when they escaped through the Red Sea. I mean, there's a heck of a lot of pressure in this. He's responsible for this group of people to go back into the promised land. Now, some people say, why were they taking the land off other people? But if you go back further into Genesis, you will see that the Israelites actually occupied this land in the time of Abraham and in the time of Joseph. It was Joseph's carting off into Egypt and then the subsequent drought and the people there couldn't eat, so they went and went into Egypt to feed off the stores that were in Egypt, the food that had been stored because uh, Joseph had said to Pharaoh, you need to do this. And so they moved out of the land. And then subsequently, they became slaves for some 400 years. And you know what happens if you leave the front door unlocked for a length of time, somebody's going to come and squat in your house. And that's exactly what happened. And so they weren't taking the land off other people. They were repossessing it, if you will. Kind of like if you don't make the repayments on your car, somebody's going to come and repossess it because it's rightfully theirs because you haven't made the payment. And so it wasn't that they were taking the land off people, they were reclaiming what was in fact rightfully theirs. But the people that had been there for some 440 years were now quite strong, were quite embedded. number of generations had lived there and known nothing else. And so Joshua found himself in this place where he had leadership and authority. And I don't know about you, but sometimes in life we find ourselves in a situation where we say, I didn't ask for that. And I found myself in these situations as we've moved through this time, trying to get um, used to um, doing things a different way. I didn't ask for it. You didn't ask for it. Those of you who have been isolated from family, you didn't ask for that. People who have lost their jobs, they didn't ask for that. All of these things that happen that are completely and absolutely out of our control, we didn't ask for them. But God gives us a way to adapt and to move forward if we trust him. Because the only thing we have in our mind is what was, and we compare everything to that. And so for Joshua, what was, he'd never known anything else but Moses leading. And now Moses is gone. You're up, mate. 
batter up. It's you. And, and some of us have found ourselves in those situations, whether it's in our families, whether it's in our work situations, whether it's in our community, whether it's in our street. We found ourselves in situations where we go, I've got to make a decision, but I didn't ask for this. Well, Joshua was the same. He didn't ask for it. But he stepped up to the plate. And, and I, when, when we see uh, uh, God speaking to him, God says to him, Moses, uh, Joshua, I want you to go and take the land and I want you to be strong and courageous. In fact, it says it three times in this chapter. I want you to be strong and courageous. I want you to be strong and very courageous early on in the passage. So this is from God. And then in the latter part, the very last line is the people saying to him, we'll follow you if you are strong and courageous. So this is a, a massive theme in this chapter. And so oftentimes we, we, we think if, if God says he's going to do something, we have this kind of pedestrian um, uh, understanding of what that means. I mean, for, for some of us, we think, you know, with, with our Bibles that, you know, we've got this Bible, it's the direct word of God, and it, and it kind of just dropped out of heaven one day. Well, it didn't. The reason it is written is because people were obedient to do the hard slog writing it. Now, in, in Moses' time, when, when, when the Israelites were back in Egypt, there were people who were scribes who were probably taking notes about, you know, when they were building things, about the number of bricks and all that sort of stuff, keeping stats around their construction work as, um, as slaves in Egypt. But then as we move forward and, and they move out of there, there's the first evidence of this book actually being written is, is in fact in Exodus. And those people who were probably the ones who kept notes and, um, and, and, and counts and administrative, they were the ones who probably started to write things down. And, and it's very clear in Exodus that the reason that God asked them to write things down was to show people just how gracious he was in his salvation work towards people. And so if, if, if we understand that this is very much a spiritual book, that it's influenced by the Holy Spirit, but it's also the sweat and tears of men and women who wrote it. And when God asks us to do something, it's not that we go and, uh, and go, okay, God, well, that's great. I'm going to sit back and I'm going to wait for you to do that. No, he's actually asking you to participate in what he's doing and in your participation, be strong and courageous. Be very strong and very courageous because this is going to take a toll on you. I remember a movie many years ago called Field of Dreams. And in that movie, Field of Dreams, there was this line, build it and they will come. I've heard that line spoken so many times about church. And you know what? It's just a lie. God, it's not about build it and they will come. It's about work with God and people will be added to their number. We should be looking at Acts, not Field of Dreams. And God, God desires for us to get on board with his plan and his purpose. And so it's going to take courage. We need to be strong. We need to be courageous. Because whatever God asks you to do, there is an empowerment by him, but there is blood, sweat and tears on your side as well. But you've got the advantage. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. Joshua had the advantage. He had the living God on his side. And so this is not about, this is not a pedestrian view of God dropping a victory in Joshua's lap. This is about God saying to Joshua, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you back the land. I'm going to use you to do it. But if you're going to do it, you need to be very strong and you need to be very courageous because it's going to be tough. There are going to be people in your own group who go, shouldn't do that. They're going to rebel. They're going to be like Achan. They're going to get a little bit selfish and do things for themselves rather than for the whole. There are going to be cities that you oppose who, um, uh, who are tough and, and hard work. 
There are going to be things like Jericho where you have to march around the walls and people are going to look at you and go, what the heck is this guy doing? Doesn't he know anything about modern warfare? You're going to need to be very strong and very courageous. And for each and every one of us, as we go through these times empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit, there are going to be people that think, some of us are crazy. Why aren't you panicked? Why aren't you worried? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Because we are confident in God. The other thing that, that God asks Joshua to do in verses 8 and 9, he says, meditate on my word. I love this bit. He says, if you want to be prosperous and successful, meditate on my word. Now, I, I believe that one of the things that God is doing in this time is that he is bringing his church to a realisation that our confidence and our strength and our capacity to see the gospel message go out into this world is not about the size church that we are, the pastor that we have, or the, the groups that we run. It's actually about who we are in him as a body collective. God is using us as a body. And so the things that we thought we put um, uh, our strength in, we don't. And, and the, only way to stay, the only way to stay close to God is to get to know him. And the best way to get to know him is to read and meditate on his word. Now, when, it, when we say read and meditate on his word, this is not, I'm going to read a chapter and then close my Bible and go to work. This is not about ticking a box and saying, oh, I'm just going to do that. No, this is about reading, pondering, reflecting, applying, changing. This is what God wants to do when we read his word. It's about the change that he wants to bring through our interaction with him. And so he's not saying to Joshua, mate, get up in the morning and read your Bible and tick a box. No, meditate on, your word, on his word. Figure out how God wants you to change or how he wants to challenge you, how he wants to encourage you so that you can be the best that you can be. Our time with the Lord is so important. And, and, and we see here, for a guy like Joshua to be effective in what God's asked him to do, the, where he got his strength from, where he got his inspiration from, where he got the, the capacity to change and be more like God wanted him to be was through reading and meditating on his word. And this is what God wants for us as well. It truly transforms our heart. And then he says, be strong and courageous. Be very strong. Very courageous. The only way that you and I can make wise, informed decisions, the only way that we can attain wisdom, and, 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 and James says this very clearly, if you lack wisdom, you should go and ask God for some because he will give it to you. But the only way to gain wisdom is from God. Godly wisdom is far superior to earthly wisdom. And Joshua needed this in spades as he was moving forward. And, 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 and the only way that we make bad decisions is when we're panicked. I heard somebody say that the, you should never make lifelong decisions when you're drunk or when you're panicking. Now, we're good Baptists. We don't get drunk, so I don't have to talk, I don't have to talk about that, I hope. The second thing is when you're panicked. If you're panicking, you will never make a good decision. How do you stop panicking? You take the focus off self, you take the focus off the situation, and you focus on God and look at the situation and look at self through that prism. And you can't shortcut that. You can't shortcut that by meditating and understanding his word. I wonder if in this time you are a more disciplined person. In the, in the early stages, there were two things that, were, that I noticed that were going on. One was there was a heck of a lot of people walking out in the community because they just wanted to get out of their houses and so exercise went up. Uh, I saw an article on the news that said sales of push bikes have gone through the roof um, because people are out there getting and exercising and putting some of that discipline into their life. The other thing that I noticed was that people were panic buying toilet paper and fighting about it in the, in the grocery stores. And so 
There is good and there is bad that can come out of situations like this. We just need to make sure we do the good. What are the disciplines? Are you more disciplined in reading God's word? Are you more disciplined in focusing on him? Are you more disciplined in bringing decisions and areas of your life that require wisdom to him rather than doing what you think? Proverbs says, I think it's 16.22, it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. That's earthly wisdom. But see, godly wisdom actually says, follow him and you will in fact be prosperous. Now, God said this to Joshua, um, you will be prosperous. Um, And... When we think of that, uh, we think of prosperity in earthly terms. We think of prosperity in terms of money and finances. But that's because our heart's conceited and, and oftentimes it's the only currency we think about in the West. But God's not talking about that to Joshua. He's act- Well, it, it's kind of a both and. He, he's talking about the fact that you will regain the land, but true prosperity comes from knowing the Father. True prosperity comes from relationship with him. True prosperity comes from the disciplines of maintaining that relationship. Because God says, I will provide all that you need. Not necessarily all that you want, but I will provide all that you need. That's prosperity. And if you have any doubts about whether we are a prosperous nation, all we need to do is go to a developing country and realise that we really don't have anything to complain about in that area. And so God will, in fact, bring prosperity, but that prosperity comes about because of our relationship with him and it's prosperity divided, defined in God's terms, not in human terms. Towards the end of this chapter, there is a dialogue between Joshua and the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh who were going to settle uh, on on the opposite side of the Jordan River. They could have said, we're going to just put our roots down and the rest of you can go over the Jordan and fight these people because that was the land that had been given to them. There were two and a half tribes on the eastern side of the Jordan and the other tribes on the western side that they had to go in and take. And it would have been easy for them to say, well, you, that's your plan. We've got our inheritance. We'll just, you guys, off you go. But that's not what God wanted. He actually wanted his people to fight together. Not to fight for selfish outcomes, but to fight for collective, unified, godly outcomes. And one of the, one of the clear markers of a body or a a group that is truly unified is unification of purpose and unification of mission and meaning. God has called us to be people that share the good news. God has called us to be people that are a light on a hill. God has called us to be people to uh, see people reconciled back to himself through the gospel message. It's not about us. One of, the, one of my guys I like to listen to is a guy called Francis Chan. And he talks about the fact that when we read the Bible, quite often we superimpose ourselves into the main character. And you know what? We aren't the main character. God is the main character. This book is written as a testimony of how God saves his people. This book is written about God and you and I are the objects of salvation. We aren't the saviours. We aren't the centre. And too often in our Western culture, in our Western society, we, we think or we are told to think that we are the centre of the universe or that everything should be about us. You are number one. Yet when, when God calls us to follow him, he actually calls us to drop that thinking and to say that he is number one. And more than that, he says, I want you to to, to live 
with a servant heart. He says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So it's a double whammy. And everything Joshua does in this particular passage is not about him. We saw with David last week that he said when he had victory over the Philistines that this would be a testimony to declare the greatness of God. Joshua is doing exactly the same thing. His victory is not about him. It's not about drawing attention to him. It's not even about drawing attention to the people of God and, and, and who they are. Their goal is to bring attention to God. When God talks about the Israelites being a chosen people, the confusion around that is that they are chosen, that they are special. Now, they are special, but their chosenness was that they were chosen to declare the greatness of God. Not chosen as them being the object of the chosen, but God being the object of the chosen. They are chosen to give glory to God. And so I would encourage you, we are not the centre of this story. When you read the Bible, you aren't the centre. God is. His plans are. And this is the understanding that Moses had, sorry, that Joshua had. And this is the understanding that the tribes had when they came together. They, had, they were one in unity. They were one in purpose. One of the things that I hear quite regularly is where people say, I have lost my joy. I have lost all purpose. I remember seeing a, a news clip when the when the orig, original lockdown was brought down. I mean, I, I like to ride my motorcycle up uh, Mount Glorious and there are a lot of other people that like to ride as well. And the first Sunday that you could actually go for a ride up on Mount Glorious, it was absolutely packed. And there were so many people who had had their bike in the shed who were just itching to get on it that couldn't, but they did, because that's their joy. Now, I love motorbike riding, but that's not my joy. You see, when we deny self, when we say to God, I want to surrender my life to you, I want to ask you to forgive me of my sin. Now, our sin is quite often, is quite often our self-centeredness and our pride that makes us the centre of our own story. When we say, I actually want to give that up because my purposes, my dreams, my plans are nowhere near as good as the dreams and the plans that you have. And I want to be part of that. I actually want to hitch my wagon to you. And so joy comes about not in finding your passion. Joy comes about by finding your saviour. And the joy that we have is about being part of something that is in fact bigger than us and having the joy to journey with others in that bigness. And so Joshua, this was not about Joshua. Now, somebody had to be the leader and Joshua was it. He, he, God had said, you're it, mate. But, but it wasn't all about him. It was about the people. And it was about this group going in to reclaim what was rightfully theirs. As you read further on in Joshua, you see that while the people, the Israelites were afraid, because they were basically just farmers they were, and, and, and slaves, they, they weren't warriors. While they were afraid, there were people in the land who were afraid as well because they'd heard about the greatness of God and that God had bring, brought victory to these people. So I want to encourage you today. If, you, if, if, you're, if you're facing things that you have not faced before and, and, and your, your response is, just get me out of it and let's just get back to normal. Can I, I want to challenge that thinking today because I want you to think about rather than trying to escape your reality, connect with God to help you deal with your reality. If you're a believer today and you're not meditating on the word, you need to start meditating on the word. You need to read it, apply it, Spend time just in quiet with God. Nothing else. Just let him speak to you through it. If you don't know him today and you're feeling overwhelmed, can I encourage you 
to explore the things of Jesus. If, if, you, if you're ready to, if you would like to become a Christian, and all, and all becoming a Christian means is understanding that when we are selfish and self-centered, we, 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 we do things our way. And God says, I created you to serve me. I created you to worship me, not worship the things that you want to worship. And the, the barrier between us and God is sin because God is perfect and we aren't. But the great news is that because Jesus died on the cross, he forgave us of sin. And because he rose again, he empowered us to live a new life. This is available for anybody who would receive that, who would come to God in repentance and, 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 and say sorry for what we've done and actually choose to live a life empowered by God. If that's you, if you're ready for that, then I would encourage you to pray with me today. But don't, don't be overwhelmed. Take courage, be strong and courageous. Be very strong and very courageous because we can be in the strength of God. Not in our own strength, but in His strength. Let's pray. Father, for those who don't know you this morning, for those of of us that have not committed our lives to you, who are not followers of you. Father, we just come to you. And if that's you this morning, you just say to God, forgive me and I choose to follow you. And I would encourage you to just reach out to us if you've prayed that prayer. For those of us this morning who are believers, where we have tried to navigate this in our own strength. Father, we pray that you would help us to come back to you, to, to focus on you, to read your word, to meditate, to allow our lives to align with you, to trust your thinking, to trust your wisdom rather than our own. And Father, that we would step out in confidence and that we would be strong and very courageous because we know who you are, and we know that we are empowered by you. Father, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, for the example of these godly men and women. We thank you for Joshua. We thank you for the, the great example he is to us. And Father, rather than running away from tough times, teach us to run into them in your strength and in your power. Father God, we want to thank you for today, and we thank you for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of the day and let's focus uh, on God as we worship uh, to finish up.